Chapter Three of A House to Let. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. A House to Let by Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, Elizabeth Gaskell, Adelaide Anne Proctor. Chapter Three: Going into Society. At one period of its reverses, the house fell into the occupation of a showman. He was found registered as its occupier on the parish books of the time when he rented the house, and there was therefore no need of any clue to his name. But he himself was less easy to be found, for he had led a wandering life, and settled people had lost sight of him, and people who plumed themselves on being respectable were shy of admitting that they had ever known anything of him. At last, among the marshlands near the river's level that lie about Deptford and the neighbouring market gardens, a grizzled personage in velveteen, with a face so cut up by varieties of weather that he looked as if he had been tattooed, was found smoking a pipe at the door of a wooden house on wheels. The wooden house was laid up in ordinary for the winter, near the mouth of a muddy creek, and everything near it, the foggy river, the misty marshes, and the steaming market-gardens, smoked in company with the grizzled man. In the midst of this smoking party the funnel chimney of the wooden house on wheels was not remiss, but took its pipe with the rest, in a companionable manner. On being asked if it were he who had once rented the house to let, grizzled velveteen looked surprised, and said, Yes. Then his name was Magsman. That was it, Toby Magsman, which lawfully christened Robert, but called in the line, from an infant, Toby. There was nothing again Toby Magsman, he believed. If there was suspicion of such, mention it. There was no suspicion of such, he might rest assured. But some inquiries were making about that house, and would he object to say why he left it? Not at all. Why should he? He left it along of a dwarf. Along of a dwarf? Mr. Magsman repeated deliberately and emphatically, along of a dwarf. Might it be compatible with Mr. Magsman's inclination and convenience to enter as a favour into a few particulars? Mr. Magsman entered into the following particulars. It was a long time ago, to begin with, a four lotteries and a deal more was done away with. Mr. Magsman was looking about for a good pitch, and he see that house, and he says to himself, I'll have you, if you ought to be had. If money'll get you, I'll have you. The neighbours cut up rough and made complaints, but Mr. Magsman don't know what they would have had. It was a lovely thing. First of all, there was the canvas, representing the picture of the giant in Spanish trunks and a ruff, who was himself half the height of the house, and was run up with a line and pulley to a pole on the roof, so that his head was coeval with the parapet. Then there was the canvas, representing the picture of the Albina lady, showing her white hair to the army and navy in correct uniform. Then there was the canvas, representing the picture of the wild Indian, a scalping a member of some foreign nation. Then there was the canvas representing the picture of a child of a British planter, seized by two boa constrictors. Not that we never had no child, nor no constrictors neither. Similarly, there was the canvas representing the picture of the wild ass of the prairies. Not that we never had no wild asses, nor wouldn't have had em at a gift. Last, there was the canvas representing the picture of the dwarf, and like him too, considering, with George the Fourth in such a state of astonishment at him as his majesty couldn't with his utmost politeness and stoutness express. The front of the house was so covered with canvases that there wasn't a spark of daylight ever visible on that side. Magsman's amusements, 
fifteen foot long by two foot high, ran over the front door and parlour windows. The passage was a arbour of green bays and garden stuff. A barrel organ performed there unceasing. And as to respectability, if threatens ain't respectable, what is? But the dwarf is the principal article at present, and he was worth the money. He was wrote up as Major Tupershovsky of the Imperial Bulgradarian Brigade. Nobody couldn't pronounce the name, and it never was intended anybody should. The public always turned it, as a regular rule, into Chopsky. In the line he was called Chops, partly on that account, and partly because his real name, if he ever had any real name which was very dubious, was Stakes. He was a uncommon small man, he really was. Certainly not so small as he was made out to be, but where is your dwarf as is? He was a most uncommon small man, with a most uncommon large head. And what he had inside that head, nobody ever knowed but himself. Even supposing himself to have ever took stock of it, which it would have been a stiff job for even him to do. The kindest little man as never growed. Spirited, but not proud. When he travelled with the spotted baby, though he knowed himself to be a natural dwarf, and knowed the baby's spots to be put upon him artificial, he nursed that baby like a mother. You never heard him give a ill name to a giant. He did allow himself to break out into strong language respecting the fat lady from Norfolk, but that was an affair of the art, and when a man's art has been trifled with by a lady, and a preference give to a Indian, he ain't master of his actions. He was always in love, of course. Every human natural phenomenon is and he was always in love with a large woman. I never knowed the dwarf as could be got to love a small one, which helps to keep em the curiosities they are. One single idea he had in that head of his, which must have meant something, or it wouldn't have been there, it was always his opinion that he was entitled to property. He never would put his name to anything. He had been taught to write by the young man without arms, who got his living with his toes. Quite a writing master he was, and taught scores in the line. But Chops would have starved to death afore he'd have gained a bit of bread by putting his hand to a paper. This is the more curious to bear in mind, because he had no property, nor hope of property, except his house and a sarsa. When I say his house, I mean the box, painted and got up outside like a regular six-roomer, that he used to creep into with a diamond ring, or quite as good to look at, on his forefinger, and ring a little bell out of what the public believed to be the drawing-room window. And when I say a sarsa, I mean a chainy sarsa, in which he made a collection for himself at the end of every entertainment. His cue for that he took from me. Ladies and gentlemen, the little man will now walk three times round the caravan and retire behind the curtain. When he said anything important in private life, he mostly wound it up with this form of words, and they was generally the last thing he said to me at night before he went to bed. He had what I consider a fine mind, a poetic mind. His ideas respecting his property never come upon him so strong as when he sat upon a barrel organ and had the handle turned. After the vibration had run through him a little time, he would screech out, Toby, I feel my property coming. Grind away. I'm counting my guineas by thousands, Toby. Grind away. Toby, I shall be a man of fortune. I feel the mint a jingling in me, Toby, and I'm swelling out into the Bank of England. 
such is the influence of music on a poetic mind. Not that he was partial to any other music but a barrel organ, on the contrary, hated it. He had a kind of a everlasting grudge agin the public, which is a thing you may notice in many phenomenons that get their living out of it. What riled him most in the nature of his occupation was that it kept him out of society. He was continually saying, Toby, my ambition is to go into society. The curse of my position towards the public is that it keeps me out of society. This don't signify to a low beast of a Indian he ain't formed for society. This don't signify to a spotted baby he ain't formed for society. I am. Nobody never could make out what Chop's done with his money. He had a good salary, down on the drum every Saturday as the day came round, besides having the run of his teeth, and he was a woodpecker to eat, but all dwarfs are. The sarser was a little income, bringing him in so many eightpence that he'd carry him for a week together, tied up in a pocket handkerchief. And yet he never had money. And it couldn't be the fat lady from Norfolk, as was once supposed, because it stands to reason that when you have a animosity towards a Indian, which makes you grind your teeth at him to his face, and which can hardly hold you from goosing him audible when he's going through his war dance, it stands to reason you wouldn't, under them circumstances, deprive yourself to support that Indian in the lap of luxury. Most unexpected the mystery come out one day at Egham Races. The public was shy of being pulled in, and Chops was ringing his little bell out of his drawing-room window, and was snarling to me over his shoulder as he kneeled down with his legs out at the back door, for he couldn't be shoved into his ass without kneeling down, and the premises wouldn't accommodate his legs was snarling, "'Here's a precious public for you! Why the devil don't they tumble up?' When a man in a crowd holds up a carrier pigeon, and cries out, "'If there's any person here who's got a ticket, the lottery's just drawed, and the number as has come up for the great prize is three seven forty two. Three seven forty two. I was giving the man to the Furies myself for calling off the public's attention, for the public will turn away at any time to look at anything in preference to the thing showed em, and if you doubt it, get em together for any individual purpose on the face of the earth, and send only two people in late, and see if the whole company aren't far more interested in taking particular notice of them two than of you. I say I wasn't best pleased with the man for calling out, and wasn't blessing him in my own mind, when I see Chops's little bell fly out of window at her old lady, and he gets up and kicks his box over, exposing the old secret, and he catches hold of the calves of my legs, and he says to me, Carry me into the wan, Toby, and throw a pail of water over me, or I'm a dead man for I've come into my property. Twelve thousand odd hundred pound was Chops's winnings. He had bought a half ticket for the twenty-five thousand prize, and it had come up. The first use he made of his property was to offer to fight the wild Indian for five hundred pound aside, in with a poisoned darning needle, and the Indian with a club. But the Indian being in want of backers to that amount, it went no further. After he'd been mad for a week, in a state of mind, in short, in which, if I'd let him sit on the organ for only two minutes, I believe he would have bust, but we kept the organ from him, Mr. Chops come round, and behaved liberal and beautiful to all. He then sent for a young man he knowed, as had a wery genteel appearance, and was a bonnet at a gaming booth, most respectable brought up, 
father having been imminent in the livery stable line, but unfortunate in a commercial crisis, through painting an old grey ginger bay and selling him with a pedigree. And Mr. Chop said to this bonnet, who said his name was Normandy, which it wasn't, Normandy, I'm a-going into a society. Will you go with me? Says Normandy. Do I understand you, Mr. Chops, to intimate that the whole of the expenses of that move will be borne by yourself? Correct, says Mr. Chops, and you shall have a princely allowance, too. The bonnet lifted Mr. Chops upon a chair to shake hands with him, and replied in poetry, with his eyes seemingly full of tears. My boat is on the shore, and my bark is on the sea, and I do not ask for more, but I'll go along with thee. They went into society in a shay and four greys with silk jackets. They took lodgings in Pell Mell, London, and they blazed away. In consequence of a note that was brought to Bartlemy Fair in the autumn of next year by a servant, most wonderful got up in milk-white cords and tops, I cleaned myself and went to Pall Mall one evening appointed. The gentlemen was at their wine at a dinner, and Mr. Chops's eyes was more fixed in that head of his than I thought good for him. There was three of em, in company, I mean, and I knowed the third well. When last met, he had on a white Roman shirt and a bishop's mitre covered with leopard skin, and played the clarionet all wrong in a band at a wild beast show. This gent took on not to know me, and Mr. Chop said, A gentleman, this is an old friend of former days. And Normandy looked at me through an eye-glass and said, "'Magsman, glad to see you,' which I'll take my oath he wasn't. Mr. Chops, to get him convenient to the table, had his chair on a throne, much of the form of George the Fourth in the canvas, but he hardly appeared to me to be king there in any other point of view, for his two gentlemen ordered about like emperors. They was all dressed like May Day, gorgeous, and as to wine, they swam in all sorts. I made the round of the bottles, first separate, to say I had done it, and then mixed them all together, to say I had done it, and then tried two of them as half and half, and then t'other two. Altogether I passed a pleasing evening, but with a tendency to feel muddled, until I considered it good manners to get up and say, Mr. Chops, the best of friends must part. I thank you for the variety of foreign drains you have stood so handsome. I looks towards you in red wine, and I takes my leave. Mr. Chops replied, If you'll just hitch me out of this over your right arm, Magsman, and carry me downstairs, I'll see you out. I said I couldn't think of such a thing, but he would have it, so I lifted him off his throne. He smelt strong of Madeiri, and I couldn't help thinking, as I carried him down, that it was like carrying a large bottle full of wine, with a rather ugly stopper, a good deal out of proportion. When I set him on the doormat in the hall, he kept me close to him by holding on to my coat collar, and he whispers, I ain't happy, Magsman. What's on your mind, Mr. Chops? They don't use me well. They ain't grateful to me. They puts me on the mantelpiece when I won't have in more champagne wine, and they locks me in the sideboard when I won't give up my property. Get rid of em, Mr. Chops. I can't. We're in society together. And what would society say? "'Come out of society,' says I. "'I can't. You don't know what you're talking about. "'When you have once gone into society, you mustn't come out of it.' "'Then if you'll excuse the freedom, Mr. Chops,' were my remarks, shaking my head grave, 
I think it's a pity you ever went in. Mr. Chops shook that deep head of his to a surprising extent, and slapped it half a dozen times with his hand, and with more wife than I thought were in him. Then he says, You're a good fellow, but you don't understand. Good night, go along. Magsman, the little man will now walk three times round the caravan and retire behind the curtain. The last I see of him on that occasion was his trying, on the extremest word of insensibility, to climb up the stairs one by one with his hands and knees. They'd have been much too steep for him if he'd been sober, but he wouldn't be helped. It won't long after that that I read in a newspaper of Mr. Chops's being presented at court. It was printed, It will be recollected, and I've noticed in my life that it is sure to be printed that it will be recollected, whenever it won't. That Mr. Chops is the individual of small stature, whose brilliant success in the last state lottery attracted so much attention. Well, I says to myself, such is life. He has been and done it in earnest at last. He has astonished George the Fourth. On account of which I had that canvas new painted, him with a bag of money in his hand, a presenting it to George the Fourth and a lady in ostrich feathers, falling in love with him in a bagwig, sword, and buckles correct. I took the house, as is the subject of present inquiries, though not the honour of being acquainted, and I run Magsman's amusements in it thirteen months, sometimes one thing, sometimes another, sometimes nothing particular, but always all the canvases outside. One night, when we had played the last company out, which was a shy company, through its rain in Evans hard, I was taking a pipe in the one pair back along with the young man with the toes, which I had taken on for a month, though he never drawed except on paper, and I heard a kicking at the street door. Hello, I says to the young man, what's up? He rubs his eyebrows with his toes, and he says, I can't imagine, Mr. Magsman, which he never could imagine nothing, and was monotonous company. The noise not leaving off, I laid down me pipe, and I took up a candle, and I went down and opened the door. I looked out into the street, but nothing could I see, and nothing was I aware of, until I turned round quick, because some creature run between me legs into the passage. There was Mr. Chops. Magsman, he says, take me on the old terms and you've got me. If it's done, stay done. I was all of amaze, but I said, done, sir. Done to your done and double done, says he. Have you got a bit of supper in the house? Bearing in mind them sparkling varieties of foreign drains as we guzzled away in Pall Mall, I was ashamed to offer him cold sausages and gin and water, but he took em both and took em free having a chair for his table, and sitting down at it on a stool like old times. I all of a maze all the while. It was after he had made a clean sweep of the sausages, beef, and to the best of my calculations two pound and a quarter, that the wisdom as was in that little man began to come out of him like perspiration. Magsman, he says, look upon me. You see afore you one has both gone into society and come out. Oh, you are out of it, Mr. Chops. How did you get out, sir? Sold out, says he. You never saw the like of the wisdom as his head expressed when he made use of them two words. My friend Magsman, I'll impart to you a discovery I've made. It's wallable. It's cost twelve thousand five hundred pound. It may do you good in life. The secret of this matter is that it ain't so much that a person goes into society 
as the society goes into a person. Not exactly keeping up with his meaning, I shook my head, put on a deep look, and said, You're right there, Mr. Chops. Magsman, he says, twitching me by the leg, society has gone into me to the tune of every penny of my property. I felt that I went pale, and though naturally a bold speaker, I couldn't hardly say, Where's Normandy? Bolted with the plate, said Mr. Chops. And t'other one, meaning him as formerly wore the bishop's mitre. Bolted with the jewels, said Mr. Chops. I sat down and looked at him, and he stood up and looked at me. Magsman, he says, and he seemed to myself to get wiser as he got also. Society taken in the lump is all dwarfs. At the court of St. James's they was all a-doing my old business, all a-going three times round the caravan in the whole court suits and properties. Elsewhere's they was most of them ringing their little bells out of make-believes. Everywhere's the saucer was a-going round. Magsman, the saucer is the universal institution. I perceived you understand that he was soured by his misfortunes, and I felt for Mr. Chops. As to fat ladies, he says, giving his head a tremendous one against the wall, there's lots of them in society, and worse than the original. Hers was a outrage upon taste, simply a outrage upon taste, awakening contempt, carrying its own punishment in the form of a Indian. Here he give himself another tremendous one. But there's Magsman, there's his mercenary outrages. Lay in cashmere shawls, buy bracelets, strew em and a lot of handsome fans and things about your rooms. Let it be known that you give away like water to all as come to admire, and the fat ladies that don't exhibit for so much down upon the drum will come from all the points of the compass to flock about you, whatever you are. They'll drill holes in your art, Magsman, like a cullender. And when you've no more left to give, they'll laugh at you to your face, and leave you to have your bones picked dry by waltures, like the dead wild ass of the prairies that you deserve to be. Here he give himself the most tremendous one of all, and drop. I thought he was gone. His head was so heavy, and he knocked it so hard, and he fell so stony, and the sacerdotal disturbance in him must have been so immense that I thought he was gone. But he soon come round with care, and he sat up on the floor, and he said to me, with wisdom coming out of his eyes, if ever it come, Magsman, the most material difference between the two states of existence through which your unhappy friend has passed. He reached out his poor little hand, and his tears dropped down on the moustachio, which it was a credit to him to have done his best to grow, but it is not in mortals to command success. The difference this. When I was out of society, I was paid light for being seen. When I went into society, I paid heavy for being seen. I prefer the former, even if I wasn't forced upon it. Give me out through the trumpet in the hold way to-morrow. After that, he slid into the line again as easy as if he'd been aisled all over. But the organ was kept from him and no allusions was ever made, when a company was in, to his property. He got wiser every day. 
his views of society and the public was luminous, bewildering, awful, and his head got bigger and bigger as his wisdom expanded it. He took well and pulled him in most excellent for nine weeks. At the expiration of that period, when his head was a sight, he expressed one evening, the last company having been turned out and the door shut, a wish to have a little music. Mr. Chops, I said, I never dropped the mister with him. The world might do it, but not me. Mr. Chops, are you sure as you are in a state of mind and body to sit upon the organ? His answer was this. Toby, when next met with on the tramp, I forgive her and the Indian. And I am. It was with fear and trembling that I began to turn the handle. But he sat like a lamb. It will be my belief to my dying day that I see his head expand as he sat. You may therefore judge how great his thoughts was. He sat out all the changes, and then he come off. Toby, he says with a quiet smile, the little man will now walk three times round the caravan and retire behind the curtain. When we called him in the morning, we found him gone into a much better society than mine or Pall Mall's. I give Mr. Chops as comfortable a funeral as lay in my power, followed myself as chief, and had the George the Fourth canvas carried first in the form of a banner. But the house was so dismal afterwards that I give it up and took to the wan again. I don't triumph said Jarber, folding up the second manuscript, and looking hard at Trottle. I don't triumph over this worthy creature. I merely ask him if he is satisfied now. How can he be anything else? I said, answering for Trottle, who sat obstinately silent. This time, Jarber, you have not only read us a delightfully amusing story, but you have also answered the question about the house. Of course it stands empty now. Who would think of taking it after it had been turned into a caravan? I looked at Trottle as I said those last words, and Jarber waved his hand indulgently in the same direction. Let this excellent person speak, said Jarber. You are about to say, my good man. I only wish to ask, sir, said Trottle doggedly, if you would kindly oblige me with a date or two, in connection with that last story. A date? repeated Jarber. What does the man want with dates? I should be glad to know, with great respect, persisted Trottle, if the person named Magsman was the last tenant who lived in the house. It's my opinion, if I may be excused for giving it, that he most decidedly was not. With those words Trottle made a low bow and quietly left the room. There is no denying that Jarber, when we were left together, looked sadly discomposed. He had evidently forgotten to inquire about dates, and in spite of his magnificent talk about his series of discoveries, it was quite as plain that the two stories he had just read had really and truly exhausted his present stock. I thought myself bound in common gratitude to help him out of his embarrassment by a timely suggestion. So I proposed that he should come to tea again on the next Monday evening, the 13th, and should make such inquiries in the meantime as might enable him to dispose triumphantly of Trottle's objection. He gallantly kissed my hand, made a neat little speech of acknowledgment, and took his leave. 
for the rest of the week I would not encourage Trottle by allowing him to refer to the house at all. I suspected he was making his own inquiries about dates, but I put no questions to him. On Monday evening, the 13th, that dear unfortunate Jarber came, punctual to the appointed time. He looked so terribly harassed that he was really quite a spectacle of feebleness and fatigue. I saw at a glance that the question of dates had gone against him, that Mr. Magsman had not been the last tenant of the house, and that the reason of its emptiness was still to seek. "'What I have gone through,' said Jarber, "'words are not eloquent enough to tell. "'O oh, Sophonisba, I have begun another series of discoveries. "'Accept the last two as stories laid on your shrine, "'and wait to blame me for leaving your curiosity unappeased "'until you have heard number three. "'Number three looked like a very short manuscript, and I said as much. Jobber explained to me that we were to have some poetry this time. In the course of his investigations he had stepped into the circulating library to seek for information on the one important subject. All the library people knew about the house was that a female relative of the last tenant, as they believed, had, just after that tenant left, sent a little manuscript poem to them which she described as referring to events that had actually passed in the house, and which she wanted the proprietor of the library to publish. She had written no address on her letter, and the proprietor had kept the manuscript ready to be given back to her, the publishing of poems not being in his line, when she might call for it. She had never called for it, and the poem had been lent to Jarber, at his express request, to read to me. Before he began, I rang the bell for Trottle, being determined to have him present at the new reading, as a wholesome check on his obstinacy. To my surprise, Peggy answered the bell, and told me that Trottle had stepped out without saying where. I instantly felt the strongest possible conviction that he was at his old tricks, and that his stepping out in the evening without leave meant philandering. Controlling myself on my visitor's account, I dismissed Peggy, stifled my indignation, and prepared, as politely as might be, to listen to Jarber. End of chapter 3 Recording by Ruth Golding